Have you ever been like me and struggled with your fly cast at longer distances? Have you ever wondered why that dreaded tailing loop occasionally pops into your cast? And do you know how to do the double haul properly and when to snap? We're going to talk about these three items and much more today as we dig into the fundamentals of the fly cast. And today we've got a big guest for you. One of the greatest fly casters in the world is going to be our guide. This is the Wet Fly Swing podcast where I show you the best places to travel to for fly fishing, how to find the best resources and tools to prepare for that big trip, and what you can do to give back to the fish species we all love. Hey, I'm Dave, host of the Wet Fly Swing podcast. I've been fly fishing since I was a kid, and I grew up around a fly shop, and have created one of the largest fly fishing podcasts in the country. I've also interviewed more of the greatest fly anglers than just about anyone in this country. Today, Tim Raja, founder of Echo Fly Rods, a world champion fly caster, and the dude who is known for the nerdy rod skills and building the toughest fly rod on the market. Today, Tim is going to tell us how he built that rod and how it became the toughest rod. He's also going to give us the three biggest fly casting takeaways today, and uh, and you're going to find out about the paintbrush analogy, something we've talked about before, but this is critical a critical part of the cast. He's going to find out, you are going to find out why you should experiment with your grip pressure when casting and also why you need to look up the extended finger grip. All this today and much more. Plus, we're going to hear the story of how his brother has the first graphite rod ever built in the world. This is a great episode and it doesn't get any bigger than this one. Tim Ray Jeff from EchoFlyRods.com. How you doing, Tim? Uh, Dave, it's a pleasure. I'm doing great. Great. Yeah, this is really awesome to put this together. I, I Last time we had you on, it was episode 483 um, with the, the new owners of Echo. We talked about that. I'll put a link in the show notes to that episode. It was really cool because I'd been wanting to get you on for quite a while. We finally talked, but we didn't get the whole story. So today we're going to talk about, we're going to get the full background. I want to hear some of the some of the, the secrets and the good stuff about how you made this, uh, how you did this thing, which is pretty amazing, I think, what you built. But um, let's take it back real quick to fly fishing. Give us, remind us again, what's your, how'd you get into it? What's your first memory of fly fishing? Hmm, good question. We just had a, what's your earliest memory? Um, uh, last night, I had some friends over for dinner. Kath and I have a place up in central Oregon, and we had a 12-year-old girl at the table and an 87-year-old. And most of us can remember back, it was crazy, until you're about four years old. So I vaguely remember at that age going to Golden Gate Park. Uh, I grew up right near Golden Gate Park in San Francisco. And uh, lo and behold, there's some lakes there. And and it is the mecca for casting. And that's spinning and fly casting for accuracy and distance. It's There's a club called the Golden Gate Angling and Casting Club. And I remember as a four-year-old, like throwing bread to the ducks and seagulls at the one pond and then going over and watching these old guys and cat old men and women cast so my connection to fly fishing started from regular bait fishing like i don't know dave were you a, are, are you a reformed bait fisherman or do you still i'm a early like young kid bait fisherman, but i started fly fishing probably when i was eight or something like that Woo! yeah man you're you're way ahead of me yeah a um, little bit well probably not seriously until i was maybe 12 but i was around it yeah and it was in oceans and rivers and stuff yeah, I mean, I'm kind of an Oregon, you know, I mean, the Deschutes was like one of my, that was kind of my home river. Cool. Well, I mean, that's like learning to play golf at some major this fancy course or something. So in, in my life, we would buy prawns and go fish with hand lines off the piers in San Francisco Bay. Um, and then through this kind of stumbling through this Golden Gate Park connection hooked up at the this Golden Gate Angling and Casting Club. And um, I have an older brother, three years older than me, named Steve. And he was like, when he, I tell people when my, I, so I sort of followed in my brother's footsteps in terms of competition and casting. But like, I could just see the doctor delivered my little brother and he comes, hold, hands the, my brother to my mom. And, and my brother probably looked like a fiddler crab. You know, he's got this lobster forearm. Yeah. So uh, when my brother chose a sport, it wasn't, tennis or golf or cross-country skiing it was it got into cat he got into casting and was 
clearly the literally the best that's ever walked the planet. Just wow. beat his instructor in the first tournament, was world champion as a young man at, at 20 years undefeated. And he Jeez. was a little bit like um, somebody you didn't, you, you know, what do you, how do you compete with that? So I looked at other stuff and was, you know, we'd go fishing in the park for carp and, you know, cause trouble and throw dirt claws at the buses driving. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't have that dedication uh, that my brother did. And, uh, but it was still, hey, you know, as a young teen, my brother had to drag little Timmy along to the fly casting club. And so I slowly got into it a little more and more. And it was in my late teens, uh, early 20s that I said, I'm going to kick his ass. So <laughs> I really trained and did self hypnosis and, and uh, I lifted weights, worked on speed bag time training and, and got to where I actually beat him one year. And I realized at the end of that, I uh, just wasn't into it in the competition world as much as he was. And uh, it was a really good experience, of course, to be at that level. And it, it's something anybody can do. The fun thing about casting is, you know, us old guys can kick some of the young kids butts right. still. That's right. And did you ever take lessons, Dave? No, that's one thing I did. I was kind of self-taught and I think to this day, it's still one of my struggles. I mean, I, I, I'm okay. You know, I can cast uh, an eight weight, you know, steelhead sort of set up, nine foot, eight weight, but it's, yeah, I, I lots of struggles for me. Well, you can imagine if you started your sport, like um, uh, instead of just fishing, you'd just go practice and you did that. Like my brother would practice 300 and something days a year for like four years, five years in his formative early career. Well, that's, you know, maddening. But, you know, if you don't live right on a river and you have, uh, hula hoops in your backyard and you could practice. So that type of dedication was kind of my early years. And yeah. um, I just wasn't into it as much as my brother. And and uh, so it does help though, right? I mean, yeah. the times when you practice and then you go fish, it makes your life easier on the water. That's what I learned mostly. I think I've learned now from doing all these interviews, you know, with everybody is that yeah, practice. That's the the number one thing. You know, you need to. And I never really did. I was always out fishing. I love. I think I'm a great fisherman, and I'm just an okay caster. You know what I mean? That's kind of me. Yeah, yeah. I I I don't play golf often, but when I do, I have a group of my buddies. I'm like, so how often do you guys practice? And they're like, no, nah, we don't want to practice. We just want to go play golf. Exactly. And I would say, everybody listening to this, if you did want to get uh, better uh, on the water, then you need to put some time in away from the fish. You yeah. just need to make that happen. And there's some fundamentals we can talk about, ways to improve your casting. And I don't want to geek out on on the history of casting or any of that stuff. But there's sure. still some fundamentals in casting that have not changed. Um, that we, uh, we all, uh, every good fly cast anybody's ever made, some good stuff happened. And it's the same from a beginner to an expert. If your loop rolled forward and it didn't tangle and you didn't hit yourself and it landed where you were aiming... And there's a couple things that happen. And then there's typical problems that are things that people struggle with. But overall, I would say that if somebody like you and I could hang out for an hour, I would say even experienced guys like you with tens of thousands of casts or hundreds of thousands of casts and thousands of hours, usually we struggle and it's a, it's a fundamental that we um, struggle with. Right. Um, it's not like, oh, you know, your timing's off 4%. Or, right. you know, if you could shift your weight, usually it's like, dude, your back cast didn't line up with your forward cast. Dude, your your snap came too soon. That's why you threw a tailing loop. You know, just some common sense things. And we can rattle those off pretty easily. Um, and hopefully they translate into people getting out there and casting when you're not fishing. Yeah, I think they will. What are the, let's just go, and I got a bunch of questions here, but I think on the fundamentals, let's just go down that route for a little bit. Because I think when I cast, I think the struggle for me is I can cast really w pretty well short. And I think as some, you get some distance out there, maybe it's, I don't know, 50 feet, 60, maybe it's 80 feet. You know, there's some longer cast where it starts to break down. So maybe talk about what are those fundamentals that people should be thinking about if maybe they struggle at a little bit longer distance. Well, I'd say the, the, the there's a, uh, the stroke length varies with the distance of the cast. That one's common sense. You wouldn't take a giant long stroke to throw 30 feet, nor would you expect to take a tiny little wrist flick and have the line go 100 feet. So there's, um, if you go to the fly fishing uh, 
the Federation, the Fly Fishing International, they have in their casting thing, they have a list of these fundamentals. But the the some of them, the easy ones to get are um, the stroke length varies with the distance of the cast. Um, and that relates to the rod um, bending less when you throw a short cast and more when you bend a long, throw a long cast. So long distance, long stroke, short distance, short stroke. That one makes sense, right? Yep, it does. Um, and, and I have to premise all this with saying that the goal of a good cast is the loop rolls through the air and it doesn't tangle and it's not too wide. So if, in a, you know, if you're looking from the side of a normal trout cast, if you see somebody casting and the loop is 10 feet tall, that usually means it's not going to straighten out well and it's affected by wind. And if somebody throws a one foot wide loop, an expert loop, then it cuts through the air better and it tends to straighten out better. So if you do these fundamentals properly and execute them, your loop will be smaller and it won't tangle and it'll go where you're aiming. So to get a good loop, your stroke length varies with the distance of the cast. Your, uh, you have to wait for your cast to straighten out on your back cast and forward cast. That's kind of timing. D Dave, have you ever seen somebody or heard the fly snap and you hear this loud cracking sound? Yeah, I've done, yeah, I've done that plenty of times. Yeah, yeah. Well, what is that? What's that from, you think? That's a too quick, too quick on your, your you're not giving enough time to load up to flat, straighten out, right? So your back cast was going back and it hadn't straightened out, like you said, and you started forward. And you know what that sound is, right? I used to do casting demos. <laughs> yeah, what is it? Is it just the leader? I always think it's just the, the end of the leader snapping. Yeah, yeah. Well, first of all, it cost you three or four bucks because you snapped your fly off. But the reason it makes that high cracking sound is the tip, tiny bit of that fly line broke the sound barrier. Oh, the wow. The tip it went over 700 miles an hour, cracking a whip. So that's a miniature sonic boom, just like the fighter planes do. Um, so that noise means you didn't let the line straighten out. So that's the same in the front and the back. And that just depends. But, you know, if, obviously if you wait too long, the line straightens out and then lands on the ground. And that's a tough one. You just have to sort of, you can look at your back cast. You can have your buddy or significant other put a shock collar on you <laughs> and push the button if you, yep. if you rush your cast. So you got to let your cast straighten out. The, this one's a little more subtle. It's called the 180 degree rule. If you're trying to aim at a target in front of you, your back cast should be opposite the target. You wouldn't throw a kind of a crooked back cast and then expect it to straighten out. Just like you wouldn't pull a bow back on an arrow, let go and have the arrow go crooked. So your back cast and forward cast need to be lined up. So if your back cast is low behind you, it's going to want to go up in front. So if sometimes, you know, if, if you're trying to make your fly straighten out, you'd see it land in a puddle. You might have had good timing, good acceleration, all these other things, but you just, your back cast was too low. So you need to let, raise your back cast so that your forward cast goes down. That's the 180 degree rule. That's another one that is almost easier to see than it is to describe. And uh, the, boy, I'm, I don't want to miss anything. So we, the, the one that I think gives all of us the most trouble is the this concept of acceleration or saving the power for the end of the cast. And if you over accelerate or if the rod bends too much in the middle of the cast, then the rod tip dips below a level and you get a tailing loop. So imagine I give you a, a, a you know, an average fly rod with an average amount of line out and you come forward smoothly, it should feel like you're flicking water off a paintbrush. That means you start slow and you snap at the end. And it's the same in golf. Golfers don't take and swing as hard as they can right at the, from the stop, as they say. Everything, most throwing motions, baseball pitchers, they gradually accelerate and it's that snap at the end, that last bit of force that has is very important in casting that that be concentrated near the end of the cast and equipment changes that a super soft noodly dave have you thrown a fiberglass or a bamboo rod before yeah, yeah i have i have it's yeah it's more it's a little more uh, noodly what did that look like <laughs> yeah it was uh, it was a little you know I, I actually i told this story before my one of my, my first steelhead rod my dad ever gave me i can't remember how old i was probably 15 or something was an old lama glass i still have it sitting right here and it's a, and it's a noodle and I love it. It actually casts a sinking line really nicely. I don't, you know what I mean? So I don't, so that's kind of almost, it feels like a fiberglass rod, but I think it is graphite, but yeah. The reason I ask that is softer rods require a more gradual acceleration. 
and stiffer rods require a more aggressive acceleration. Uh, and right. all of this in slow motion, yep. if you look from the side and you look at a good cast, it doesn't seem possible, but this arc, windshield wiper move with your hand moving back and forth, when it's perfect, when the loop goes out narrow, the rod tip tracked in a straight line. And this is technical instructor mumbo jumbo. Uh, you'll know it when you make a cast and it's straightened out versus if you're like painting an igloo and the rod tip traveled in a big curve, like you're literally like flopping it back and forth like a beginner's first cast, that line typically lands in a big puddle, right? Uh, beginners, they can't get their line to straighten out. So then they start accelerating, they shorten their stroke, they do all these other things, and then they get that little snap at the end. That's the hardest thing to learn. Before I give you the best analogy in the world for learning that, the other, the other fundamental is stop and unlike um, other sports, like uh, throwing a ball, hitting a baseball, hitting a tennis right, ball, uh, kicking, a, kicking something, there's a follow through yeah. in most sports. Even like surf casting, you know, you kind of release and you're, the rod flops forward. In fly casting, we accelerate to a stop. So basically what happens is the rod begins to bend and bend and bend and it gets fully bent and then boing, you stop your hand, your toes, you, bite your tongue, whatever you need to do to get that to stop. And when you do that, the rod unsprings and contributes to the cast. I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. But that stop is not natural. I mean, can you can you think of one throwing or accelerated motion, Dave, that doesn't have a follow through? No, I mean, I played all the sports. I love sports and I can't think of, yeah, every, I was a baseball player, basketball, the follow through is key. You're not going to make a shot if you don't follow through, like everything. Yeah. Baseball, you hit the ball. Nobody stops. No. I figured there's two that I can think of. The first one's boxing. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> you know, you accelerate, you plow, you hit somebody in the yeah. nose. Boom. There you go. Um, the other one is I didn't, I've never played lacrosse, but they kind of, they got the net and the stick and oh, they, right. boom, they have this little snap. Yeah. Yeah. They don't follow through and have this big. That's true. Um, so anyway, that's, this stop is a, is a key thing. And I think the best casters in the world stop in, if most efficiently. And then, so this thing, I would say if, if I could ma wave a magic wand over the eight people that are listening to this, <laughs> that, that, that are having, having second thoughts about their <laughs> casting, yeah, I would say that if you could accelerate the best, that will improve your casting more than timing and all those other things. Because those are intuitive. You can see it. You can't see the snap. No. It's like trying to watch a, you know, if you played baseball, the, you know, the, the, the pitcher's hands a blur, that last, uh, you know, 45 degrees of rotation on a baseball bat, it's a blur. Right. You can't, and how do you control a twitch that's happening in a quarter of a second? I know. You know, you, you sort of can't, you sort of, or I haven't, I, I know a few people that have been able to adjust or cast that accurately at that last little explosive move, that snap. Um, and I was, uh, one of the early, uh, wonderful instructors that I worked with, um, in Seattle area, Tony Vitale, him and his wife, Marilyn. Um, I don't know if you met him. They're up in Issaquah. No, I haven't. He said, and I don't know if he got it, but I'll just give him credit. He said, um, the perfect acceleration is like flicking water off a paintbrush. Yeah, it's perfect. So if Kath and I, we used to do a lot of instructions. Now we don't, but we used to have paintbrushes and have everybody line up with a little bucket of water and a paintbrush. So let's say you dip that water and the paintbrush is by your ear and you want to flick water off that paintbrush. What happens if you snap too soon? Where does the water go? Uh, if you snap too soon, it goes uh, down or back. I don't know. It sprays, it spray, like let's say the paintbrush is pointed up, yeah. like it's a fly rod and it's in your hand. When If you snap really hard right away, the water sprays up in the air. Just up, right. It doesn't even go anywhere, right. Yeah. It just kind of arcs. Yep. Like there was a famous flash dance movie that the dancer dipped her hair in the water and had this big spray. Anyway, or do watching a dog spray water everywhere. Yeah. So now if I said to you, take that paint, same paintbrush, come forward and flick the water at the end. Better yet, if I said, if I'm standing three feet in front of you and I say, flick all of that water off that paintbrush and hit me in the nose, you're going to, your hand's going to go right to my nose and it's going to snap. It's going to snap at the beginning, the middle or the end of that stroke. Yeah, right. You're going to snap the water at the end yep. and all that water shoots off the bristles. Yeah. And you start slow and That's faster, the, faster, faster, and then snap it. And it, if you're going to try and snap all that water at one spot, like hit me in the nose, would you? Would your hand travel in a curve like you're painting an igloo or come in sidearm? No, straight on. 
Probably not. Wouldn't your hand go right to the target, snap at the end? Like throwing a dart at a dartboard? You know, you don't twist and spin. So this idea of the paintbrush, if everybody could just visualize that, yeah, that's the secret to casting. Angler's Coffee roasts some of the highest quality coffee on the market, and every bag you purchase goes to support the fish species we love. My favorite this month is the Woolies Blend, the dark roast that Joe has worked his magic, meets my needs, and uh, and I can't explain exactly what it is, but it's smooth and uh, and just right to get my day started. You can head over to Anglers right now at wetflyswing.com slash anglers to support a sustainable company with unsurpassed taste. As we kick off another big season of fly fishing, I'd like to connect you with Drifthook to make sure your fly selection is seamless this year. Drifthook has everything from nymphs to dry flies, hoppers, streamers, and of course, their Euro Nymph fly kits. You can order right now at drifthook.com. That's D R I F T H O O K, drifthook.com, and use the code SWING at checkout to get 15% off your first order. Who came up? Who who came up with that? You, I, I'm sure that's been around forever. But is that something like I? I remember somebody saying Lefty Cray, but uh, did, who came up with that paintbrush? Who, who was the first? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Twenty something years ago, I heard it from Tony and uh, Vitali, but I think maybe that's a Google search. Yeah, it's a Google um, search. So here's here's one for me as a rod designer, or when some you know sometimes when you line people up and you're helping them, and and you and the person X has a really stiff fly rod. And, and but they're a slow caster. It's too stiff. I I try and give people the next step on the paintbrush analogy that helps them to know what fly rod is good for them. So here's an analogy I came up with a few years ago. Imagine I gave you a paintbrush with really long bristles, like six inches long, and you dip soak that in water and it's kind of flopping around and, and it's up by your ear and you tried to hit splash somebody and flick water off that paintbrush. If it had long, soft bristles, how would you do that? Would you describe that for me, Dave? With long, soft bristles as compared to a shorter, normal paintbrush? Yeah. Um, I would, uh, I mean, I think it almost feels like you could do the same thing. You start slower. Would you do it faster? I'm not quite sure. I've never used a, I mean, I would think I would kind of do a similar <laughs> deal. <laughs> start sl- say like start slow and then speed up and flick it. Stop. Good. Well, I mean, that would be good. Um, the soft bristles require a little smoother acceleration, not as aggressive, and maybe a little longer stroke. So instead of a little one foot flick, it would be your hand might travel two feet to try and lob this water and flick it off the brush. So a soft fly rod is like a long bristled paintbrush. Softer rods or fiberglass rods, which we uh, uh, designed a bunch of fiberglass rods at Echo, they require or they they most perform best and give you the good loop if you're a little longer and smoother with your acceleration. You still come to a stop, but it's like takes a little bit smoother acceleration to get to that stop. Now, I take a pair of scissors and I cut those bristles off. Those bristles on that paint pressure are now one inch long. They're stiff. It's like a, you know, really. so then you dip that same brush in the water. Now, how would you flick water off a short, stiff bristled brush? Yeah, and just do it, you just do it quick. You do it quick, shorter, more aggressive, right? Yeah. yeah. Cuz if you made a big long one it doesn't help you, you got to go boom and you got to flick it harder and shorter. That's a stiff fly rod. Yeah, a fast action rod. That's a fast action for a rod. Fast action and stiff, and we're going to go over that cuz that's a big um it's an example of a term fast and stiff. But let's just say it's stiff. I gave you, you know, stiff fly rod and it's like a short bristled brush. You just have to be shorter more aggressive and um, and a soft, and that's a stiff fly rod, and most of the time it's fast, but let's just say stiff, and a soft fly rod or a bamboo or a fiberglass rod is like a long paintbrush bristle, and you just gotta slow down and lengthen, and in both cases, if your hand goes in a straight line, you tend to get a better loop. Straight line, yep, that's it. Yeah, this is all, I love the analogies. I think um, another, another one you hear about, and I'm not sure, the 10 to two. So talk about that. I think new people come in, you know, like maybe it started on the river runs through it, you know, got famous, but you know, what is the, is the 10 to two, is there any truth to the 10 to two? Is that something anybody should be thinking about? Well, that's a good question. So imagine you have the hands of a clock and what they're trying to give somebody an idea is with a certain amount of line, the first, the first fundamental is the distance of the stroke changes with the length of the line. Yeah. 
So that's the simplistic way to say that rule. But if I gave you 10 feet of fly line and you had a 10 to two stroke, that would be too big of a stroke for a short yeah, line. Yeah, then right. if I pulled out 80 feet of line, 10 to two might be too, excuse me, 10 to two is too long of a stroke for a short line. And it might, and then if I pulled out a bunch of lines, 60, 70 feet, then it might be too short. But for the average trout fisherman, when you're just getting started, you don't learn with a 10 foot line, nor do you learn with 80 feet. So as instructors, when I started teaching when I was 13 years old for the Fenwick Fly Fishing School and spent the year in Montana working at their fly fishing school, we would pull 30 feet of line out. Well, with 30 feet of line and a typical four or five weight trout rod, the stroke length ends up being about 10 o'clock to two o'clock. It could be maybe one o'clock to 10 o'clock. Sure. But the idea is it gives the average beginner somewhere to visualize where do they stop the rod behind them yep. and where do they stop it on the front. Right. Because without that instruction, they end up making this big giant arc like they're painting an igloo. So they go all the way to the ground behind them, all the way to the ground in the front. Right. The line doesn't go anywhere. So this 10 to 2 is a beginner, overly simplistic, and oftentimes inaccurate yep. beginning point. Beginning point. That's right. And, and so... So you have that. So the ten, and, and I think of all sorts of casts. I mean, I guess you, you know, from a beginner, right? You start, you learn, you get the basics, the fundamentals, like you talked about. But eventually, once you get good, you know, you hear about people fishing the salt flats and stuff, where you're sight arming and doing all this crazy stuff. What talk about that? It, like, is there a next level once you kind of master the fundamentals that you can just take it to another level and do all sorts of crazy casts? Like, how, how would people think about that? Um, well, you got practice, <laughs> um, and again, um, when you learn to cast, we keep everything as simple as possible. We don't talk about how much wrist. We don't talk about what direction your hat's facing. We don't uh, encourage sidearm casts versus vertical casts. Um, and then when you start fishing and you've got trees overhead and you're trying to skip your line under the trees, or if you're in the flats and you're, you know, just, you got a thousand dollars for a guide and they take you out on a calm day and you have a heavy fly, and if you throw a big vertical cast, plop, that fly lands so hard it might spook the fish. So we learn to cast at different planes. So what I mean by that is uh, most people visualize a fly cast where the rod's uh, vertical, pointed straight up and down, and the loop is rolling straight over the line uh, in a vertical cast. Imagine you're standing next to a giant warehouse wall. And you're 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 standing three feet from the wall, and your fly line's just right next to that wall. That's vertical plane. Well, there's times when you'll throw at a 45 degree angle or throw sidearm, and that lowers the profile. It changes things. It's how trout fishermen curve their line. It's how flats anglers achieve casts where the fly doesn't land as far and land softer. And um, so, as you get better at the fundamentals, you need to start playing around and experience different techniques for speed, different techniques for presentation. And one of them is this sidearm or angled cast. And uh, th so that's kind of what, when, if I understand your correct, yeah, well, that's what that flats kind of thing is. Yeah, that's a flat thing. And what about another one? I know this is a stumbling block for especially new anglers is the double haul. You know, when do you, when do you bring in as a teacher, the double haul or even the haul or any of that stuff? Yeah, that's a really good question. Usually it requires a beer. No, I'm just kidding. Um, usually <laughs> the uh, usually the double haul, and, and I remember as a child teaching with uh, Mel Krieger, he was at first with the Fenwick School and then he had his own schools. We would take beginners and at the end of the second day of casting, we would teach the double haul and we would pantomime it without a line. And we give almost no instruction after the first pantomime because your brain's already full of all these fundamentals and, oh my gosh, Dave, you stopped your car. Oh, that was a good cast. Oh, that was a bad cast. Oh my goodness. You know, so you, we have all of these fundamentals drilled into your brain, acceleration, stroke length. How good did you stop? Was your trajectory good? And now you got to do something with your non-casting hand. And I equate it to juggling. If I gave you three balls and I was going to help you juggle, 
Can you imagine if I tried to describe it geometrically? Okay, you're going to throw the first ball up um, at a velocity of X, and it's going to curve slightly and uh, make sure it goes like 32 degrees off center. And then you got two balls in this other hand, right? Or the two balls in this hand. And then halfway, you know, a third of the way through its trajectory, you got to throw the other ball opposite, but don't hit it. I mean, it's like, holy crap. What you do is you hand people three balls. And you come back in ten minutes. Yeah. Oh, really? You hand yeah. so you kind of tell. Uh, yeah. How would you, and how would you tell teach somebody to juggle? Like you just you kind of show. I guess you would show them. I don't know. Can you juggle? Can, Do you can know you juggle, juggle three balls? I can. I can juggle. Yeah, yeah, I can juggle three balls. I can juggle two with one hand, but it, but the three balls I right. get about like four or five in, and then it then it fails. But I can do a little bit. Well, what we used to do with juggling was you got one ball in each hand, and you throw the first ball up. And before it lands and gets to the other hand, you throw the second ball back to the first and you go yeah. catch, catch. Yep. And then you do it again. You throw the first ball up, catch, catch. So a little bit, um, I learned, like I said, I learned from Mel Krieger at the, the double hall where we did it without rods. So we would just have both hands in front and pantomime the rod hand going back and your non-rod hand coming down and lifting back up. And I don't, you know, it's obviously, yeah. I, it's I'm sitting here double hauling in pantomiming on an audio program. I look like an idiot. I, I had Joan Wolf on uh, way back in episode, I think it was 100. And she gave me a bunch of, it was a great fun show, but she talked about the double haul and she said, I think she said, you don't do the, the second haul until right at the end. I think when you flick, I can't remember. She, she, I would have to go back and look at that, but you know, right at the end is when you do it and then you pull. Is that, is that right. kind of the case right at the end? Well, um, kind of to wrap up the whole description of it. So once you have the pantomime, um, then we put a fly line and we usually make a shooting head, something that slides better. And we start with a pile of line in front on a field and then you back up until it's tight. And then you make your back cast with your left hand going down up and then it hits the ground behind you. And then you, some people do it sidearm so you can look at it. Then you drag that slack out of it. So we just break it into letting one cast hit the ground in the front wait five seconds, 10 seconds, pat him on the back, give him a cup of coffee. Then you do the back cast. So you start to try and get the juggle feel of the pantomime into a back cast and a forward cast. But before we do this, what is the purpose and the function of a double hull? It's it's speed. Is it line speed? Is that the main thing? Ding, 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 ding. You it. win, Dave. It. You get behind what's <laughs> door number two. Right. So that's what it is. Yeah. Now it does it by, in simplistic terms, let's say without a double hull, you can move the fly line or the rod tip 100 miles an hour. And and, and in fact, there was a study done, it was unpublished, by Bill Smith, a retired um, psychologist in Los Angeles. I have the original, um, I have the original uh, imagery and documents. He never published it. But he made a 40-foot cast and he recorded all this technical data. One of the things he recorded is how fast is the line moving to make a 40-foot cast. Well, it turns out it was going 39 miles an hour. Now, you know you can make a cast that barely straightens out or you can smash it 10 times harder than you need to and it comes splashing fast. So, But just for the rest of our discussion, if we just agreed that one mile per hour of speed goes one foot, this will kind of help with your visualization. So let's say without a double haul, you're casting as hard as you can. You can get the fly line and the fly to shoot out there at 100 miles an hour. Now, if your left hand can slide and snap at 50 miles an hour, in theory, you add those two together, more or less, in a very simplistic way. So your 100-foot cast now became a 150-foot cast. Now, obviously, the average trout person and nobody throws 150 feet. But it's just in a very simplistic way, the reason we haul is exactly what you said. It increases the line speed. And line speed is a function, uh, a fly rod is a, this is um, tying this together. I won't lose you. A fly rod does two things. It's a lever and it's a spring. So have you tried fly casting without a rod before, Dave? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, just the, just, yeah, yeah I've done yeah. that. Yep. I'm doing it right now. Yeah, so you can you know can't throw very far, yeah. but you know you can do it. Yeah, it's, it's fun to show off. So um, I made a broomstick for a casting demo once. I took a five foot broomstick, taped guides to it. So that broomstick made is a longer lever. It's, it helped me get distance, but it didn't bend at all. Right, it's yeah. completely stiff. So a fly rod 
not only does it give me leverage, the other thing a fly rod does, and the same thing for a spinning rod or a casting rod, is it's a spring. Because have you ever, you've bow and arrowed cast before when yeah. you bend the rod back yep. and bend it back Shoot like it. a bow and arrow and let go and bing. So in a bow and arrow cast, 100% of the line speed comes from the spring in the rod. In a super stiff fly rod or the, you know, the example of a broomstick, there's no spring. So when you look at a slow motion video of a fly cast, a good one, and they go accelerate, the rod's bent back like a big letter C, and then you stop your hand and then the rod goes fling and contributes to the cast. And Bill Smith's study, he recorded frame by frame and measured it against a black background with a grid. And he came up with a, on his day, a 63 year old average build, nine foot five weight, 40 foot cast. What? So he measured that the fly line is moving, accelerating, gaining speed, the rod's fully bent, and then fling, then the rod adds speed to the cast. It's the spring effect that I'm talking about. And you can visualize it, right? You see what's going on? Yep. So I did this uh, presentation right after I got that information, and I did it in front of some famous casting instructors and anglers. So I'm going to quiz you. What percent of that 39 mile per hour cast... What percent of that comes from the spring in the rod? What percent what comes from the spring versus the lever and that 30 mile? I would say, I, I mean, 50%. Well, that's pretty good. Guess. A lefty uh, said 80. Okay. It's like, well, it turned out it was 29%. Comes from the, the spring. The spring in the rod. So this is where, just like good golfers, you see this person that's a slight build and they can hit the ball farther than somebody who's big and tough and fast. When you get the right fly rod, and we'll go through those fundamentals on what a fly rod is, but when you get the right fly rod and you combine it with a fly line that's comfortable for you, you get more spring. So the rod contributes more miles per hour to your cast. Yep. And that seems, yeah, of course. Like if you, know, if you, if you give a 80 pound 10 year old a stiff 12 weight fly rod, they can't bend it. They're not strong enough. They're losing distance. They're not getting that spring. If you give them an eight weight, then they're bending it more. If you give them a six weight, they bend it the most. So this idea that in this one guy's test, 29% of the spring came from the spring of the rod, uh, the, came from the spring of the rod. That means maybe a casting lesson and you're at 35%. You know, the experts get 60%. We don't know. And that's one of the things that I'd love to do is to repeat this and put, experts, medium and beginners, and then experiment with different rod lengths, um, to, you know, get different lines and start fine tuning all this. Um, we do, when I do have an opportunity to work with somebody on their cast, and I hope you and I get to throw a fly yeah. line yeah, someday definitely. soon. Um, you know, we'll have four different lines, three different rods. We'll start combining them until we find the one that gives you the most miles per hour. And what we're going to discover is the rod bent to the max. You were able to load it the most, bend it the most, and then you came to a stop and the rod contributed more to your cast. So yeah, that's why we double haul. Oh, right. So the double haul makes up for that if you're not big enough or too big or all that. And it also just bends the rod more and it accelerates the line, bends the rod more. And if everything's perfect, bing, it all of that contributes to more miles per hour. So you use the double haul typically when you're trying to get more speed. Yeah. Yeah. I know the one thing I always use, I never really use a double haul much, but I, I would, you know, back before Spay, cause I was fishing with steelhead, like the nine foot eight weight. Right. And I remember trying to make these long casts. And that's when I really was trying to learn the double haul to get it down. And But I, again, it was always mm -hmm. struggling because then the wind would blow at you and it'd take you down and stuff. But yeah, I think it's just, it's one of those things. I think it is uh, the timing. Again, double haul, it's all about timing. Do you think that's the key of learning the double haul? Well, I can tell you the one thing that I've noticed over the years, and we used to, you know, double haul 100% of the time when we're tournament casting for distance. You are. So there, those guys are all double hauling. Hundred percent, yeah, and, and you know maybe in, even a windy day for accuracy, if they're the longer targets are fifty feet and you've had a side wind, you know if you're trying to be accurate and you got a side wind, you don't want to throw a slow line, you want to throw it fast. You know it's just like trying to cut through the wind. Here's my um, boy, I, I used to do this a lot, um, and I don't much anymore. But here's my uh, parting words on the double haul. Uh, the double haul. The line hand, the hand not holding the fly rod, we call the other one the line hand. Holding that, that 
hand should match the right hand in length and intensity. Oh, right. So let me say that again. So if your right hand is moving four feet and it's cruising in a straight line and it's kind of going medium, that's what your left hand should be doing. It should be moving four feet, going through the air, medium. If your right hand is just jamming really short and hard because the rod's stiff, then that's what your left hand should do, your, your, your line hand. So if you're making a short cast, you want a little power, you'd get a little short double haul. So just what Joan Wolf said and Lefty Cray used to say all this stuff, I think it's a bit, uh, you know, I, uh, they're, they're some of the most brilliant fly anglers on the planet with their skills. Um, so I give them credit. What happens is if you're trying to demonstrate a long cast, you're hauling and you're hitting it as hard as you can right at the end of the stroke, like flicking water off a stiff paintbrush. So while your double haul might match your right hand, but on a stiff fly rod for distance, you're saving maybe 60% of the acceleration for the last 10% of your stroke. You're really snapping it hard. So guess what your double haul will look like? It'll look long and then right by your pant leg, you snap the crap right, out of it. Gotcha. So that's where this idea, oh, you don't need the whole haul. You just need that little bit at the end. Well, if, if you, you know, without getting into all the details of how the rod bends, it just typically I have found that you match your double haul hand should match your casting hand in length and intensity. Smooth right hand, smooth double haul. Aggressive right hand, aggressive double haul. Gotcha. That's and awesome. it, that tends to provide the best loop shape with the most speed. Get ready to explore the wild with Northern Rockies adventures. Imagine yourself surrounded by pristine waters, towering mountains, and the thrill of landing a trophy fish like the majestic Arctic grayling or the elusive bull trout. With over 40 years experience guiding anglers through these breathtaking landscapes, Daniel's family operated trips promise not just a fishing journey, but an adventure of a lifetime. From the convenience of Vancouver, BC, dive into an all-inclusive experience that caters to every detail of your trip so you can focus on the thrill of each hookup. Take a look for yourself at nradventures.com slash wetflyswing and discover the Northern Rockies like never before. That's N as in Northern, R as in Rockies, adventures.com. You support this podcast by checking in at nradventures.com. It's time to talk about something that elevates your fishing experience. Stonefly Nets, nestled in the heart of the Ozarks, Ethan, a master craftsman, dedicates his skill to creating the finest wood landing nets. They aren't just tools, they are works of art blending tradition and craftsmanship. You know, every time I set my stonefly net in the water, it's not just the fish that catches my eye, it's the beauty of the net itself. These nets are tailored to your fishing style with options to customize the size, handle, and even the intricate wood burls. They are a perfect mix of functionality and aesthetic appeal. And let's talk about the memories. Just like Ethan, many of us cherish fly fishing as a way to connect with our past and creating lasting memories. Stonefly nets are more than just nets. They are part of our story, each cast and every cast. Are you ready to make fishing trips unforgettable? Visit stoneflynets.com right now and discover the difference a handcrafted net can make. Yeah, this is great. I think that was a nice little uh, little track down the fundamentals. I think one big thing, you know, and I think we're not going to get to all the questions today, but one of the things is the echo, you know, uh, what you did at Echo. I remember when the first, um, I, fir I remember when I first saw that logo. I can't remember what year it was. I, I'm, I'm guessing it was in the... I'm just guessing here it was in the nineties maybe. And I remember seeing your logo and it was like, wow, okay, this is, this is something new. And, uh, and so, but tell us about that. Tell, how did, how did the echo dream, like this thing, how did this come? Because your, your brother was the all-star you beat him there. It sounds like, but when did echo, when did that idea come to be? Well, I was working with Catherine in Alaska and then we started some fishing lodges in Russia out in the middle of nowhere. It's uh, 60 miles above the Arctic circle, kind of near Finland and Norway. And it was amazing cutting edge Atlantic salmon fishing. So we did that for six years. We'd spent six months there, a month in Baja to thaw. <laughs> and then um, at one point we started a new, our own business called Ray Jeff Sports. And uh, that was 2001. Uh, we all know September 11th, 2001, uh, the world changed. People didn't travel. Yep. It's kind of crazy. So instead of just importing air, uh, airflow fly lines, we started Echo Fly Rod Company. And um, I'd already 
been around the top level edge stuff. I had been at, working at G. Loomis Rod Company. I was oh, the yeah. fly fishing brand manager. My brother was the rod designer. I helped with engineering. He's the genius, really. I mean, that guy has designed more spinning and fly rods than anybody who's ever lived. That's your brother? Yeah. And I, I had a lot of experience, but he he had designed you know, 25,000 rods. I mean, how do you not learn something <laughs> then? Uh, so in, in working with him and learning about the materials and I, you know, so I was, I ended up being the head of the engineering department at Loomis and lo and behold, we had a fly rod, excuse me, a fly line business, uh, uh opportunity for distribution and it was airflow. So I, um, I told, uh, the owners that Loomis at that point was Shimano corporation. Mm, Gary yep. sold to the Shimano, yep. uh, famous brand. Yep. And and uh, we ended up, Catherine and I, deciding to start our own distribution business. And that was June 2001. So the Echo logo started the next year when we got into fly rods. And that's a photo that Jamie Hickson uh, and I photoshopped of me making the longest cast I could possibly make. So it's big step in weight transfer. And, you know, and that was kind of, you know, the tournament scene is kind of a frowned upon Nobody will, nobody wants to be around a tournament caster. They don't know how to fish. Those guys, right. well, you know, <laughs> yeah. some of us fish, but the uh, idea was that you know the Nike had its swoosh, and so we said, well, let's take a picture of Tim and make that our logo. So that's how the Echo logo started. Yeah, and then, lo and behold, you know, it's it's hung in there twenty something years. Yeah, twenty years, and I think we we talked about this a little bit on the the last episode, but. You know, from what I, I think you're known for around the industry is making the basically the, like the toughest, one of the toughest rods out there. And the price point is a really good price point. So describe that again. Why, what was your original idea of Echo and did it come through exactly how you planned it 20 years ago or whatever that was? Well, it was interesting because having been at that top pinnacle, Loomis had the arguably, you know, they were the first one to use paper carbon scrim. So, and here's Loomis. I was just going to say, uh, you know, Tim, one of the things I remember, because I had a Loomis that I, uh, my brother built me, um, and I don't know the exact number, but it was probably in that period sometime in there. And I remember it was so stiff. I really didn't enjoy casting it. And I actually broke it twice. <laughs> and so I don't know what that says about Loomis, but probably that they're really fast. They, maybe during that time, they're fast action and maybe a little not as durable. Uh, do, do you? Well, that's a that's a good thing. I hope to talk about that next and I'll condense all this stuff. And I apologize for these long-winded answers. But to finish on the Loomis side of things, they, the, Gary went to Boeing and got new materials. And, and you know before any of the other guys, G Gary was making rods with 100% carbon fiber. All the other fly rods out there and almost all of most of our rods have fiberglass going around and graphite going lengthwise. And it's kind of a technical, uh, it, it makes rods easier to manufacture. It makes them a little bit less man, less cost to manufacture, but it's not as light and perfect as it could be. So at Loomis, when I saw that, and I grew up in the competition world, like at, we had the lightest, best rods in the world. In fact, my brother got the first graphite fly rod in the world. Really? It's somewhere in his basement. It was somewhere in his basement. Yeah, it was Carbon fiber, which is what uh, graphite fly rods are made from, was developed in the early 70s in England in the aerospace industry. And it wasn't until late, uh, like in the mid-70s, that the price came down enough to be uh, made into rods. And uh, Jim Green, who was working at Fenwick, who later became one of the owners and founders at Sage Rod Company, uh, was making fiberglass competition distance and accuracy rods for us. And he's like, hey, I got this new stuff. It's black. It's called carbon fiber. I mean, it, th this rod even had a fiberglass ferrule. And when my brother cast it, it was terrible action. But we knew right away there was, this was some unbelievable stuff. Oh, wow. So when I started looking at high modulus and all these technological advancements, and I looked at my brother at Loomis and, you know, Sage and TNT and, Ta and Scott Rods, and, and I could go down a list of four or five other brands, Winston, that had top notch. And I was like, do I want to compete? with them. And I decided, no, I'm going to make the best rod at an affordable price that I can. And um, that's why at um, at Echo, our first series of rods were the Echo, which was, <laughs> it was just called the Echo. Yeah. Um, and they were like 120 bucks. Right. And we decided we would continue to offer that, that modest price, uh, introductory price up to the modest levels and make it perform as absolutely as best as we can. And that's been our mantra ever since. Yep. Yeah, it has. And, and does it, and I, and I think that's the interesting thing because I mean, they're, 
you know, I'm not, obviously I'm not a rod expert, but I mean, what you did, it seems like, can the other rods, all the ones you mentioned, can they not make a as durable of a rod because of how they, uh, the amount of carbon they put in it? Is that how it works? That's a really good question. Okay. Here's a killer, killer, killer analogy. I heard this one and it was, I don't know if it was Trek bicycles. Mm. One of the bicycle found, foundation, you know, one of these- Big ones. I'm trying to think of other bicycle companies, but- um, Yeah, like a Giant or there's Trek and uh, yes. Cannondale and all okay. those. Yeah. Yes. Okay. The, the founder said, strong, light, or cheap, pick two. And this applies to fly, fly rods as well. Strong, light, or cheap. You can only get two of them. So if you run a really light rod that's cheap, it's not going to be strong. Right. If you want a really lightweight, strong rod or bicycle frame, it's not going to be cheap. The technology that it takes to make these rods is mature. Gary Loomis started the first graphite uh, scrim and Fenwick was the first to bring graphite into the industry. Um, and that was 45, 50, 40 something years ago. No, more than that. 45 years ago. So in 45 years, carbon fiber, shoot, we buy, you know, golf clubs and right. obviously the aerospace industry, air, airplanes are made from it and, you know, tennis rackets, uh, ski poles. I mean, it's everywhere. And it's, there. there's, you know, it's almost like a different episode talking about the technology sure. behind it. But in essence, what happens is, is the, the equipment in a lot of these different factories has uh, matured over the years where it used to be half art and half science. Now it's pretty easy to make um, modest fibers. It's still hard and it takes unbelievable trial and error and a lot of R and D and the equipment has to be perfect to shave the last little bit of weight out of a rod. And that's why at Echo, what we do is we have seven factories we use to make our rods. So we have uh, some in Korea where we own, you know, they're the t pinnacle of what they uh, can do for the thinnest carbon fiber, f you know, very, um, high pressures on the machines to make it thin and strong. And if we tried to do that at a low price factory, like one of the ones in, in China, then they're too sloppy. They uh, just don't have that skill. Yeah. And um, again, in the bike analogy, it's like, imagine you go to a bike shop and there's a, you know, you're a, you're just trying to get your nephew a, a graduation present and he's 12 years old. You know, you're not going to pick out a carbon fiber frame and put spokes and, you know, you know next thing you know, you're into it for $10,000. No, you're, you're going to get a heavy hey, bike. Dude, can, what, what, do you got, what, what do you got for 200 bucks? Yeah. You know, yeah. that's like a beginner kit rod thing. Right. But what happens with a bike, once you decide you're going to get the next level of bike, then you go, ooh, okay, I'm going to pick out the frame. I'm going to pick out the tires. I'm going to pick out the gears and the bike brakes and the saddle and all this other stuff. So let's say you see a frame on the wall and it says it weighs 10 pounds, I don't know, uh, 10 pounds and it's 400 bucks. And you're like, that's really nice. And then off to the side with, with, you know, with a picture frame and, and, and you see a frame and it says it's eight pounds and you're like, huh, 10 pounds, eight pounds. Hmm. I wonder how much that one costs. You walk up, it's $12,000 and you fall down. You're like, what? It's 20% lighter and it's 10, it's 25 times more. So in fly rods and in bicycle frames, you pay a disproportionately large amount of money to get the last bit of performance oh, right. and the last bit of weight savings. Right. So that's it. So there is a lot. There is the truth with these rods that are over a thousand dollars. They're pretty much are worth. That's what they're they they're worth. Well, it, interestingly, if you took that ten thousand dollar bicycle carbon fiber frame meant for a racetrack, and you drive off a curb, what happens? Uh, I don't know, break it. Boom, it breaks. Yeah. Like you've shaved down so much weight that it's got a limited, but it's super light. Uh, but that $200 steel frame thing with the crappy tires, boom, hits yeah. a curb, no problem. So ironically, the fibers in the super lightest rods are typically are what we call high modulus. And that just means they don't stretch. So when you look at lifting... Um, a big fish up, or if you snag the bottom and you're trying to break your line. Interestingly, I would say in general that those super, super thin walled, lightweight thousand dollar rods tend to be less strong than a, certainly a fiberglass rod or some of the lower modulus standard graphite rods. So it's okay. You just have to be a little cognizant of the fact that you're shaving 
some brake strength away from a rod to get that last bit of performance. Yeah. And that bike analogy is the best one I can come up with for that. That's it. I love that. And I think that's the same thing for that Loomis I had. I, I My brother made it for me, but it was probably too much rod than I was I probably needed. And, you know, so it, and that's probably, it was my fault that I broke it. Um, and then Echo, like you said, is is strong and it's less expensive, but it's not as light as some of these other rods. That's correct. Kind of, yeah. There you go. Bingo. Yeah, yeah, you that's it. it. I mean, that's a good summary. And when I started the first rods, I thought, okay, um, you know, Dave, you just want a free trip to the Bahamas and you grabbed your $1,000 eight weight rod. And I'm like, dude, you got a backup rod? And you're like, uh, what do you mean? I'm like, well, you're, you're going to go all the way there. The guide could step on your rod. You could hit the fly with it on your first day. What are you going to do? You go, oh, I guess well, I don't have a thousand bucks to dump into a backup rod. And I go, well, that was one of the reasons we also started with standard material and that lower price point is I go, not only is it a good beginner rod or somebody who's getting started who doesn't know how much they want to dump into the rod, but it's also a good backup rod. So the action and power and the way the rod feels might be comparable to your thousand dollar rod. It's just not as light. Right. But it's tough. I made sure that it, you know, the worst thing that could happen is on your Bahamas trip, you break your first rod because a guide stepped on it. Your second one broke when you hooked a fish. Right. Now you're screwed. Yeah. Now you're done. And you've done some of the, uh, you know, to make them durable, you know, I, you, we talked about those videos that you have online where you're breaking rods. How, how did you, you know, how did you, is that how you tested them originally to, to know, you know, they were going to be tough enough? Yeah. I mean, every rod should have a brake strength. In fact, that's one of the fundamentals. There's nine factors in a fly rod. Should we bang through them real quick? Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, let's hear it. All right. All right. Let's see if we can do this in 60 seconds or less. Yeah. So these are the nine factors for, for that make a, now what are these exactly? Every fly rod has nine things. It's what's the length of the rod, then the action, then the power, then the brake strength, then the weight, then there's the components, like, you know, how big are the guides? What's the real seat made of? Cosmetics. And with a face meant for radio, that's never been high on my list, <laughs> but obviously that's what it looks like. Then the warranty. And then how much? How much did it cost? So interestingly, when you add all that stuff up, if you start with the same length rod and then you say, okay, um, how strong does that rod need to be? Well, if I want it to be really strong, I got to probably make it a little thicker and I probably won't use high modulus, which means the weight goes up. But when you factor all those things, when you spend, um, a, if you have a stronger rod that's light and you have beautiful, perfect components with salt water and titanium and all that, and it's beautiful cosmetics, it was painted by elves and the cork is perfect and it's all this stuff and it has a killer warranty, guess what? That's when it costs more. But I don't care if you spent a hundred bucks or a thousand dollars. The two things I'd love everybody that's listening to this get is what's the rod's action and what's the rod's power. Power. So let's talk about those two real quick. Yeah. Action in one sentence is where does the rod bend? You have fast action, bends, it's really stiff in the bottom and then it bends at the tip. Medium action kind of bends a little everywhere. Slow action, you don't commonly see these. Some bamboo rods might be a slower. That's where the the rod feels like it bends a lot in the bottom, like yeah, the old deck the Hogan spay rods we developed a long time ago. Oh, so yeah. So that's the action. Yep. Power is really simple. Power is how much did the rod bend? So the action is where does it bend? And the power is how much? So for power, there's a there's actually sort of a, the manufacturer's given you some help. And this is exactly the same for a spinning rod. If you saw two spinning rods on the rack... And one said it throws a quarter ounce, and the other one said it throws one ounce. Which one has more power? Which one's stiffer? Between the quarter ounce and the one ounce? Yeah. Um, I would think the, the heavier one has more power. Yeah, the one ounce rod. They're telling you how stiff the rod is by how much lure weight it is. Oh, right. So if yeah. you look at a rod rack, and here's a five weight rod and an eight weight rod, which one is more powerful? Which one's stiffer? Well, the eight weight rod. Yep. Because there's a certain amount of weight to an eight weight line that's heavier than a five weight line. And there's a standard for what the lines weigh. So what happens is, is action is where it bends. Like fast action rod, medium action. Interestingly, and this is just almost another discussion, but typically stiff rods are so stiff that it's hard to get the fly line started. Like that bonefish cast where you're trying to throw into the wind 60 feet and you're holding the fly. So it's really common. It's not always, but it's almost it's almost universal that really stiff rods are fast action. That means the bottom of the rod, 
might be a 5.8 weight, really stiff five weight, but the tip might be a 4.9 or a 5.0. So they put a softer tip on a stiffer rod just to help you get the cast started. Oh, right. Because when you're maxing out a long cast, the rod's bent way back anyway. The tip isn't helping you get distance. The bottom of the rod is what that spring is. You know, we talked about the bow and arrow cast or visualizing that paintbrush. Bang. So um, I do that as well. And I do that because it helps people. Because in the flats environment, you're starting with very little line out. You might, you might be walking in the flats. You might be standing in the boat. And the guy's like, oh my God, world record permit, 80 feet to your left into the wind. You're hard stomping and you're just, you got 10 feet of fly line. So that first few cast, if the tip wasn't soft, you'd, you'd be painting an igloo. You'd never get a loop. It'd be harder to throw a loop. So with that stiff rod, we put a faster tip just to get it started. And by the third or fourth false cast, and you've got 50 feet and you're shooting to 80, that's when the tip is already not doing very much. And you're bending the middle to the bottom of the rod, where it's just powerful. So that's a, um, people get action and power mixed up. They go, oh, that stiff, fast action rod. Power is how much it bends, and that's indicated by the fly line, and that's totally subjective. It's a bunch of BS. There's no such thing as a, you know, a, a standard to measure fly rod stiffness. The manufacturer said this is a five weight or an eight weight, whatever it printed on the rod. That's a starting point, and every person out there should try different fly lines until it matches their That's thing. right. Now, the action, yep. you can just hang a weight from the rod and see where it bends. Did it bend mostly at the tip? Does it bend middle, back? Action is where it bends, powers, how much it bends. How much it bends. Yeah, yeah. And then everything else, the length and brake strength, weight, all that is is kind of secondary or the-, the they're Yes. Below. These first two are the most important things. Everything else can be- um, Absolutely. You got it. Yeah. 100% ding, yeah. ding. That's, you know, and and then- you know, we all are intimidated. You go to a fly shop, there's some guy with leather patches on his elbows looking up over his reading yep. glasses. And, you, you know, you show up and you <laughs> got a tattoo on the side of your face and you're just trying to relate and they make you feel like an idiot and you don't know how to shake a fly rod. You know, now you can go, oh, what's the action? What's the power? Blah, 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 blah. Right. You can just cruise through this list and focus first on how does it feel? What's the action and the power? And then spend more money to get a lighter rod that's stronger with better components, better cosmetics, and a better warranty. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Yeah. See that? We, we busted through an hour just like that. No problem. I know. I know. I, I apologize. Um, no, it's great. I, I appreciate you for letting me kind of rattle through those. You yeah, know, And it. one of the things that we did at Echo is, you know, we've got all this, we figured it all out for you. You know, we assume that if you're getting a hundred dollar rod, you're probably not looking for the lightest, most high performance tool in the world. So we make it extra strong. We don't make it too stiff and we don't make it too fast. Later in life, as you progress, we have the next series and the next $250 rod or the $300 rod. And as you move up, we've taken, we've sourced from different factories. We look at what they can do the best. And then we source and we work with individual factories and we tell them how strong it should be. We tell them how much it should weigh. We break them. And then we work out the action and the power to match what I expect people will need. And that's the beauty. It just, you know, you kind of, you can, in today's world with the technology, and we talked about it, you can, you can really get a lot of performance for a, a reasonable sum. And that's kind of the foundation. That's how we started Echo. And that's how we still roll these days. So go on. Yeah, it seems like to me, Echo, you know, it's been, what is it now? I guess 20, 23 years. I mean, for some reason, it seems like it's, you guys have been around for even longer. You know, it's, it's, I guess that's what happens when you get older. But um, yeah, 23 years and you sold it. So why did you choose, you know, you sold the last year or so? Why was this the time to sell the company? Well, we're getting, we're getting a little long in the tooth. Catherine and I, we wanted to do some more travel. Uh, we don't have kids. Uh, Jared started the company with us. Jamie's been there. He, two years or three years after we started the company. And I wanted to continue designing rods, but I didn't want to do the day in and day out. I mean, Kath and I, for the first nine years, we didn't take a draw. She worked in a restaurant, you know, we busted ass. And, uh, you know, 20 something years is a good run. I still want to be involved. So I'm still the rod designer. Catherine doesn't have to do accounts receivable, accounts payable and run to Costco and get toilet paper. Right. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, it was time and we got some property in central Oregon. We got, a, I'm looking at the pond and the sunset over the mountains and we want to travel and fish more. Crap. You know, Dave, a good way to ruin a perfectly good fishing career is trying to make a living at it. So we couldn't think of two people that deserved it more than Jared and Jamie. They are the people that 
worked for little money early on. And so we said, if anybody should benefit from uh, the sale of Echo, it's it's those two guys. So we, uh, they they already did 90% of the work anyway. So now I, all I do is cause trouble. Uh, Catherine <laughs> gets to spend more time outside. And uh, so I show up, design rods, and Jared and Jamie are the heart and soul of the company now. Yeah. I'm so happy. I love that. And I love that you put in, you know, like you said, like nine years of, you know, the grind, because I feel like, um, you know, it's feels like in business, you kind of do that. I think that that's part of the, like your dues you put in to have success. You know, it's, ne- it's never, like, it feels like a, a good business is never going to be the easy thing. I mean, what are your thoughts there? Did you guys, sounds like you put in some grind. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, when, you know we didn't want to go into debt just to start a fly fishing business. I mean, what idiot does that? Right. You, know, you slipped and bump your head in the shower, time to make a living at a fly rod business. I mean, it was seemed like a crazy idea. It started, it was a fly line business. So we just, cranked on it. We worked out of the house for 10 years, got a warehouse. Now we're in a 10,000 square foot space and Jared and Jamie. And, you know, when we looked at, you know, how, how, do, how many rods do we make? Do we just borrow money and try and make this slam it through and just make stuff that, you know, we think people want. So we just sort of did it organically. How many rods do we need? How can we take care of people? And that's how the company just evolved from that beginning of trying to do the best we can and not overextending ourselves. Right. Uh, this is really cool. Well, and I want to start to take it out of here in a bit here with uh, going back to the Golden Gate uh, Casting Club because, I mean, I've heard tons about it. I think uh, you kind of grew up in it. I'm hopefully, I think I'm going to stop by there. We're heading down to Pleasanton and I think we're going to swing by and take a look. What, what is, maybe describe that. What What is, uh, what may, I mean, obviously some of the greatest casters have been through there, but is there something special about just walking into it? Is it like walking into like Wrigley Park or something like that? It's, it's, um, it's like a museum. Yeah. I mean, it's, first of all, it's a public facility. And when you go there, you're allowed to walk in the clubhouse. So anybody who listens to this that is in San Francisco, uh, if you're, uh, if you're staring at the Buffalo paddock, so there's buffaloes in San Francisco, Golden Gate Park, turn around and look over your shoulder. And that's the entrance to the Golden Gate Angling and Casting Club. It's uh, the finest fly fishing, casting and spin fishing facility in the world. And I've been to clubs all over the world. There's nothing even close. And why is that? It was that? built during the WPA. Okay. A um, hundred years ago, the a hundred years ago, when uh, uh, after the depression, when they were trying to, or almost a hundred years ago, they were looking for projects. You know, they were building dams. They were doing all this crazy thing. The mayor of San Francisco was a fly fisherman, and the government said we're going to build. And so he got the plans. The plans for that club are in the Smithsonian Institution, and it's this historic club where they, you know, the beams are all notched. There's displays like Winston's first bamboo fly rods there. The first shooting head oh, was wow. ever invented was there. There's there's famous world champions that have made hung their hat there. Uh, there's lockers, one foot wide, one foot deep, and 12 feet tall. You can leave your rod pre-strung. You can rent the locker. There's a 1,000 members. There's free clinics. Um, they have seminars. They have all this stuff. And then when you look out at the pond, when you're up at the locker room and you step out onto the pond, it's surrounded by 100, 200-year-old um, trees, uh, a lot of... A lot of, uh, you're only about a mile from the ocean, so it's a breezy area, and there's three concrete ponds. The first one's about two feet deep, the middle one's about four feet deep, and the last one's about six feet deep. In fact, there's targets floating, you'll see people practicing, they have distance painted lines in the bottom of the pond, and at the farthest west pond, there's even stairs that go down below the level of the water. So you could sneak out in the middle of a business meeting go down there and stand four feet below the level of the water and practice your casting as if you're waiting. Oh, wow. And it's all concrete huh. and it's there's nothing like it. It's literally, a, you, if you don't stand there with your mouth ajar, no kidding. You're, not, you're not a fly fisherman. This is cool. It's, it's, it's unsurpassed. Yeah. And it's in the middle of Golden Gate Park. You can't miss it. It's just west of the polo fields and it's a trip any fly fisherman. If you're in, in the city in San Francisco, uh, you should check that out. And if you walked... For five minutes to the northwest, you'd you'd see eight four six thirtieth Avenue, the house I was born and raised in. Oh, Roy! So you're you're right in that neighborhood. Yeah, that's. I mean, it's an accident that I got into this sport. I don't know what I'd do. Uh, it was just we happened to live, like I said, Mom brought us in a stroller out there. We grew up a half a block from the Golden Gate Park, and in the park, it's a big park. It's like Central Park. It's around New York City. It's a big park, and they have horse stables, and they had you know bocce courts and. 
uh, tennis courts and a little golf course in it. I mean, it's a, a archery and they have uh, a casting club. Wow. Believe it or not. Wow. It's pretty amazing. That is really cool. Check it out. We are. We're going to check it out. I'm going to take the family there and the kids and, and get them on the pond, hopefully. Um, what, what is? What do you think you would have done if you wouldn't have gone into you know going pro and fly fishing and all this stuff? What do you think you, you're... Man, I don't know. That's a darn good question. Yeah. I know I loved tennis. I loved skiing. Uh, I used to race for Chris Korich, a famous caster. I used to do a little slalom and GS for him. Oh, okay. He owned a ski shop. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe I'd be a monk. Or yeah. a hairstylist. <laughs> I have no idea. Right. I don't know. Fishing. Um, somebody asked me, why do you fish? And I think it's this idea of being, I don't want to just be out there photographing fish. I think fishing and being outside in that environment allows me to be a child. Yeah. I, I, I did on the back of one of our catalogs, I called it Grab the Frog. And like, let's say, okay, Dave, you and I are best buddies. We're eight years old. We go out by the by the creek and you see a frog. Oh, yeah. Do you want to like photograph it, paint no. it, or do you want to grab it? No, I want to grab it and hang on to it. And... Yeah, yeah. So you capture it. Then what do you do? Torture it? Or you sh- so you, no, you nope. turn around, you show it to me, yep. right? You go, Tim, look, this one's got, you know, oh, yeah. cross eyes. And then what do you do? You let it go. Yeah. And then we look it for the next one or we watch it swim away. We want to know what it ate. Right. You think it'll eat a worm? So fishing and the whole thing around it is so part of my DNA. That's what I want to do. And it, and Catherine to this day, she doesn't like the, the hooking the fish, she feels sure it's not cool. So she cuts 90% of the bend of the hook off. So she'll get a grab, the fish jumps, hook comes out, she smiles. I still want to touch it. I don't know. There's that grab the frog. I know. <laughs> so I think maybe I should you do. start a new broad company calling it grab the frog. But yeah. I think you resonate with that oh, as yeah. well, right? You fish for that. Yeah, I do. What, some of those same reasons. I do. Well, I think it's, it's pretty cool because after interviewing so many people, hundreds of people, you know, and- yeah, I think it's like the fly fishing is for sure we all came here for it, but there's so much more than just the fishing and the catching. You know, it's just like that's why I think people love it because it's it's all this stuff, being outdoors and connecting and you know what I mean? Like that's what's amazing. So I feel like, I don't know. I mean, have you ever met anybody that didn't love the outdoors who was a fly angler? I think that's right. Mm, no, but, you know, there's a lot of them that are just trying to set world records and catch the next big fish. That's true. And it's not about that. It's sharing, it's learning, it's seeing the environment, you know, and, and I grew up fishing bait off of the pier underneath Golden Gate Bridge, you know. Yeah, so what I were you catching out there? Out, what were the fish? Uh, we were catching smelt and perch and there was some rock cod. And then back in the old days, you could feed the animals at the zoo. So we'd keep the smelt and the perch and freeze them. And then we'd go feed the polar bears oh, and the cool. penguins and the otters and stuff. Nice. Nowadays, I don't think they let zoo no. animals eat, you know, Probably people fed them too many Snickers bars. But um, yeah, and then if we caught rock cod and stuff off the bridge, I mean, off the piers, uh, then, and that was hand lining. Oh, so, wow. you know, you got this drop line, you know, a little thing, and all of a sudden, ding, 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 you feel it on your finger. It's like a good steelhead grab. Right. You, know, you feel it, you don't see it. Yeah. Um, but I, I'd say everybody who's listening to this has the same disease that we do. And that is, you know, that grab the frog to feel it, to experience it to figure it out, to visualize what's that thing doing? How does it fit into the equation? And then seeing if your theories work. I mean, that's, that's why I do it. And I, and I just have never stopped that, that I feel like an eight year old every time I grab a fly rod. And even if I'm working on a new design, you know, and I'm just trying to make it easier for people. And so I'm always working on new designs, not just to sell another new model that I know is 90% the same. It's picking up new ideas. Like I'm working on some new eight foot, four inch rods and I'm making a nine and a 10 weight just to make it easier to throw under trees and bigger bugs. And anyway, yeah. it's all fun, man. It is good. If it wasn't fun, I wouldn't be doing it. And I appreciate you taking time. This is awesome. Yeah, definitely. No, this has been great. I think I a couple more and we'll, we'll get out of here. So one is just on, I love, you know, digging in on just uh, if you, one species. So what do you have one that's like your favorite out there? I mean, I think you've probably done it all, but dude, like if you had the only one you could fish for, what would it be? Whoa. Whoa, dude. <laughs> have you done everything? Would you eat one food all day? <laughs> have you, I, maybe have, if it was would, pizza. Would you eat, okay, one <laughs> day, okay, right, you only get one food. You have to eat it three days a week. Oh, man. I mean, three meals a day. What would it be? You're like- I could probably eat bacon and eggs every for every meal. Okay, well, there you go. Um, I So what fish is yours then? Where where and what fish would it be for you? I haven't, did, the problem with mine is, is that I'm I'm late in the game, so I haven't caught enough. I mean, I love everything. You know, and so I've got so much that I haven't done. I mean, there's so many people, you know, all these guys, Jeff Couriers, and that have traveled and caught hundreds and hundreds of fish. I'm at the other end. I love steelhead. You know what I mean? Like, I love that. But Atlantic Mm -hmm. salmon, I haven't caught. I haven't caught a tarpon. 
like all these fish that I've heard people say are the most amazing things. So I feel like if I caught a tarpon, maybe that would be cool. Um, I don't know. It's tough. But you've caught some of these, right? Yeah. Yeah. I used to do a TV show many years ago for L.O.B. and I got to travel a lot and I do a fair amount of travel. But I would say any, my fish of choice would be anything that requires a good cast. You know, if it's just lobbing some of these fisheries where you just kind of blind cast and you're stripping line back in and to some extent spay casting, you know, if you make a cast and it doesn't straighten out, the current's going to straighten it out. And half the time I don't see the fish, I don't have a target. So anything that's visual that requires a good cast, that scratches the itch. So trout fishing had been my foundational fly fishing experience and then spending a not tons certainly but uh, time in a flats environment where you're hunting and then you see it you pay attention how fast is that bonefish coming towards you or permit or or tarp into that respect um, and Mel Krieger said for him fly fishing is solitude without loneliness and I love being in a boat, a flats environment with friends but I like to kind of get out get away from people sometimes and that's where you know, in a trout environment, it's figuring stuff out. You make observations, you see fish surface, you don't, you're trying to catch them. But at the same time, it's just like that casting. And that's why this Euro nymphing thing, while it's a, a big part of the latest craze, I do it for a little bit of the day and then I don't want it. Yeah. Do it. It's, there's no <laughs> I love that you brought there. that up. You know, I love you brought Euro nymphing up because I just talked to Pete Erickson recently. He's actually, we're doing a, uh, next week, we're doing a, um, a live webinar and he's he's going to lead he's going to teach some stuff Sweet. there yeah it's been awesome and so Pete's our guy we're doing another trip to the wood we're going to be doing a clinic there with him and Brett Bishop and stuff but we joked about it because I mentioned last time we talked about you know is your own nymphing you know I'll have to I'll, I'll send everybody out to that other episode because we had that conversation like is your own nymphing actually fly fishing but I don't want to leave it there because I think that I'd rather get people some tips and takeaways so let's go back to our casting so today's conversation, we've kind of been all over the place. Give us three takeaways on somebody listening right now. They just want to become a better caster. What, what from today or just three takeaways, what would you tell them? Okay. All right. Let's figure it out. Okay. So don't lose the paintbrush thing. That's, okay, that's literally the, the finest that's huge. tip. There you go. That's number one. Okay. Number two, as you become a better caster, experiment with the grip pressure. The best casters, when you stop the rod, they don't get very many vibrations in their line because they've learned to adjust their grip. Like pinning a ruler, or if you took a fly rod and pinned it against the side of a table and bent the tip and let it vibrate. Right. So if you change that, so you look at really good casters, and Andre Agassi, the famous uh, tennis player of old, he said he would hold the, the racket lightly and then right at impact, he'd squeeze. Because oh, nice. if you grip the rod too tightly, like make a fist Perfect. right now. Put your finger up, Dave. Yep. Stick it like your fingers to fly rod. Yep. Now squeeze the other fingers really tight. And make a fist really oh, tight. Yeah. Now rotate your finger in a circle. Now now relax your grip and rotate your finger. So there's certain motions in the fly rod, and I'm just going to stick to the grip, that, that will help you. And one of them is change the grip pressure, and that'll smoothen out your cast. You might find you get less fatigue and you're more natural. The other thing is experiment with different grip grip styles. Uh, are you a thumb on top? Yeah, I am. Person, I'm a thumb Dave? on top. Yep. Okay. All right. So then when your hand's in front of your body, like your dart throwing, your thumb on top is a neutral position. If you put, if you're a caster that casts with your hand off to the side, like you're throwing a baseball, in that scenario, your palm is facing the target, not your, th and putting your thumb on top with an outside arm position is actually can be non-favorable. So I would say experiment with your grip. Try the thumb on top grip and try the extended finger grip. And that's one where you're, it's almost like your fingers on top of the rod and you're using your wrist bending like a basketball player follows through. Your wrist bends in that plane. Mm, right. So uh, you can look up the extended finger grip. Okay. So I would say play with your grip pressure and change the grips. And sometimes people smoothen out. I can have somebody that's been struggling for years and I look at them and I go, change your grip. They change their grip, their smile, they cast smoother, farther. And all I did was that one little thing and that helped them a lot. Perfect. Awesome, Tim. Well, I think, uh, you know, I, as always, I think I would love to get you back on. We'll see if we could do that maybe down the line, but this has been amazing. I think uh, it's been fun to wow. hear your story. This has been good. I'm so uh, thankful that you're, uh, took the time to, to reach out and uh, this has been awesome. And I, uh, appreciate everybody's patience listening through all this stuff and hopefully a couple of these things make sense and uh, 
please let me know the next time you're either in the Portland, Oregon area. Uh, if you want to come down, I have a casting pond in the backyard. We'll throw a fly line. Oh, nice. I want to see. Uh, I want to see this eight weight cast of yours. Yeah. And then if you're in Central Oregon, we can meet you out here too, and we'll go wet a line. Perfect. All right. Well, that'll be the next deal. Awesome, Tim. Well, thanks for your time, and we'll look, uh, look forward to keeping in touch right. with you. See ya. Thank you so much. Tim Ray, Jeff, I hope you enjoyed that one. That was uh, that was a long time coming for me. I've been thinking about this episode and so glad that uh, Tim was able to put it together. If you want to take this conversation further, you can head over to our private Facebook group and ask a question for anybody in the group here. And, uh, and if you want, we can either, even get Tim in that group and, and answer your questions a little further. That's wetflyswing.com slash Facebook. If you're interested in finding out about some of our schools this year and, uh, and some of the courses we have going, you can head over to wetflyswing.com slash school. And this is where you are going to get all the school fishing details and what we have going. And right now, as we speak, we've got the Driftless Dry Fly School giveaway going. You can enter that at wetflyswing.com slash giveaway. And, uh, and another big trip. It's happening right now. We're going to be going this year to up our skills on the dry fly. Always a big, uh, always a big hurdle for me. So I'm excited about this trip. And I am going to take it out of here, and I'm going to take it out of here with you. And I just want to say I hope you are having a great morning, a great afternoon, or a great evening, wherever in the world you are. And I appreciate you today for stopping by and listening to this show. And I am excited to, uh, to put that next one together for you. See you then. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com.